name is John Kachoyan. I'm the literary manager at Australian Plays. And we're here today talking to the ever brilliant Kate Mulvaney about her play, The Mares. Hi, Kate. Thanks for chatting to us. Hello, John. How are you? Good, thank you. Thanks for joining us. So Thank can you, you tell us about the mayors um, and sort of how that uh, production or the commission started for you? Yeah, um, a few years ago, uh, I think it was, it was about 2017. I was, 2016, 2017, I was commissioned to write uh, a new work uh, for the Tasmanian Theatre Company for, uh, for their actors, basically. It was, it was to sort of... Um, I thought it was a really lovely commission because it was to thank uh, especially their female actors for the amazing work that these, uh, this particular group of women who are all, you know, I think most over the age of 40 had given to the company. And it was sort of a, um, a beautiful commission in that way to honour these incredible female actors down there. And I said, that that's fabulous. I'm happy to do that. Uh, and then I was sort of going, well, who, uh, what do I write about? What, what, what are the, and I had, I had a chat with these women and uh, the, uh, the notion of island was always in my head. But at the same time as thinking about a beautiful play for women on an island, which sounds so kind of dreamy and, and, and luscious, I was surrounded by the news reports, as we all were, of women dying every week at the hands of uh, their loved ones, their family, their partners. Week after week after week, at least one a week, over and over and over. And uh, it wasn't even main, you know, front, front page news or main headline on the news at night. It was, it was kind of getting pushed further and further because it was just becoming this almost everyday thing. And uh, I was heartbroken by that. And, uh, and I went, well, what if that, what if our island uh, becomes a metaphor for, for that, for what is happening and what has been happening for so long? Uh, at the same time, I was living in LA uh, and I was going to all of these kind of castings and they were saying to me things like, you're so brave for having short hair. It's so masculine. And, and I was so confused by that because I suddenly I didn't fit a trope that I didn't feel I existed in any way. So these worlds smashed together and I took that commission and I started doing things like uh, Googling women on islands, <laughs> uh, warrior women, women armies, and, uh, and of course landed on, on, there were many, there were many to pick from, but the, the one that encapsulated all of them was the Amazon myth. And so the, this play flowed thick and fast from me with all of that, that information that I, I was sort of surrounding myself with and the mares is, is what came about. Fantastic. And so have you adapted anything that is sort of the, the, the Greeks or the classics? Has that been part of your work previously? Uh, it has actually. Uh, I did a version of Medea with Annie Lou Sarks um, a few years ago for, uh, for Downstairs Belvoir. And it's been of... of my plays, it's been the one that's been picked up the most around the world. It's now being performed in about eight different countries. Sometimes Annie Lou uh, directs it, uh, sometimes she doesn't, but either way, we go to it. So we've seen that adaptation, which was uh, the story of Medea told from the children's point of view. Uh, so you're basically sitting in the bedroom of the two young boys in the last hour of their lives. And of course, they don't know that. The audience knows that because we know the, the myth of Medea. Uh, and again, it was it was sort of um, Annie Lou's beautiful idea of of shifting the the lens and focusing on the victims rather than the perpetrators, mm. uh, and indeed with the perpetrator, what is their story as well? But we didn't we didn't delve into that too much, except literally through the mouths of babes, and uh, so that was that that got me really really interested in exploring the the myths of uh, of the Greeks. Um, and of course, I met you on Julius Caesar, so we've, I've always had that Roman kind of uh, uh, history in my head as well. I love it when uh, mythology and reality clash as well. Uh, so yeah, it was it was familiar territory, uh, but one that I didn't want to bring into the present as much as Medea. I wanted to keep it on its mythical island and have it smashed by reality, this mm -hmm. island, over and over and over, which actually wasn't far from the truth. <laughs> 
And what's your what's been your experience with uh, you know Tasmania and working in Tassie before the mayor? Oh, what I loved about it was the fact that uh, everyone at the Tasmanian Theatre Company, when I came to them with this very strange play that's that's probably quite a departure from the way I normally write. Uh, it's a lot more sparse. Uh, I came to them with this and said, this is what I want these, these amazing actors of yours to, to do. They read it and I remember at first they were quite thrown, but then they just went all, they just gave me their full trust. And as a result, I gave them my full trust and we, and the actors just lapped it up. They, they were characters that we don't often get to play as women even though they are the ultimate warrior women. Mm. Uh, and so it was incredible to see these performers uh, take, take these personalities and characteristics and mythology and reality on board on their own little island. Mm. Um, it was magnificent. And then, of course, the audiences came in droves. Uh, we had to add so many new performances uh, to, this, to the season because Tasmania just seemed to really, really get it. Yeah, that's definitely my overwhelming impression is that, um, you know, when I mentioned I was chatting to you about this, so many people were like, oh, my God, please tell her I loved the production. And, and obviously, yeah. Leticia and the team, uh, uh, the team that was assembled around it was, was pretty incredible. Had you worked with Leticia before? I had worked with Leticia before, um, mostly just in play developments. And once on my own development of a play called The Rasputin Affair many, many years ago, which was originally commissioned by the MTC, but then went on to have a Sydney season at the Ensemble. But Letitia was behind the, uh, the initial workshop of that. And I just, I just adored the way she works. And I've worked with her um, several times later on, on workshopping other people's plays as an actor. And so when she came on board, but when, when I heard we had Letitia, I just knew that this was going to be a very powerful piece. Letitia has an incredible, incredible dramaturgical mind, uh, but also pays such respect to the writer's instinct. And she does that beautiful thing that I think all dramaturgs should do is she sweeps the path for you. Um, she gets rid of the detritus um, or sometimes she throws more there, like throws little bombs at it going, what are you going to do about this? And what about this? And she's just a delight. Um, she is an all-powerful warrior queen in my in my eyes, and and I, it, the, this place certainly wouldn't be what it is without Letitia. Um, and do you, as a you know, as a writer, your writing career is largely paralleled your career as a performer. Do you do you feel mm -hmm. uh, an equal muscularity between those two skills at the moment? Do you do you find that they kind of out, one outpaces the other, or are they really quite quite separate no they they are separate but they feed each other beautifully uh they they have both made me better at the other thing uh i i will i often say this i will never write a character that is just sort of a sword holder they will always have their moment and i will never uh really as an actor i will never say my character wouldn't do that because I think uh, a writer has sat with that character for many, many years often. And, uh, and, and uh, in a way, that the, the moments that you think your character wouldn't do that are the most amazing, fan fascinating, complex moments of all. Mm. And that's our job as actors to, to make that work. That's not to say that actor and writer shouldn't have a very, very um, strong, generous, open-hearted dialogue with one another, but... Yeah, I, I like to think that as a writer, I respect the actor and as an actor, I respect the writer. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think especially, you know, as you mentioned, we're recording this in the middle of, I'm, I'm actually literally in lockdown in, in Melbourne. And uh, I think during this time, one of the things that's kept me going was that theatre's always been a kind of, it's always a dying art form. There's, it's kind of, it's got a mongrel kind of, um, tenacity to it and I, I I find that comforting and I don't know whether you um, a sort of find that yourself and be particularly when working with kind of older texts um, I think some of the reason we come back to them is that sense of oh those people were like me and they're thousands of years old and is, is that yeah. something that resonates for you there's definitely that that resonates for me 
Um, also, the the fact that theatre can live in so many different forms has really struck me uh, during COVID. I live with a disability. I have a spinal disability. And sometimes it is very hard for me to get to the theatre. If I'm in the theatre, I'm often in a lot of pain. I've missed some magical moments on stage simply because I'm having a bad pain day. Uh, the um, these wonderful companies that have gone to the trouble of releasing their digital theatre. Uh, I know it's not the same for a lot of people as sitting in a theatre, but it, it provides an accessibility to those of us who find it very tricky. It means we can go to the theatre. We can. We can still be an audience. We can still see the show. We can still live it and, and in a way, breathe it in a very different way. And I guess that mongrel... Uh, sense that you're talking about that that's what COVID has has brought to me and as much as I hate the fact that your incredibly generous and genius director mind is trapped <laughs> at the moment in there I'm, I'm also very very excited about the content that's buzzing that will kind of um, be opened up to us in in so many new forms that we that we know now work and can work. Coming from country Western Australia where we didn't have theatre, uh, the idea of, of uh, theatres being more generous in putting their shows out there and, and, and reaching kids like me that were growing up in a country town, that gives me goosebumps. So in a way, there is a, a big silver lining. It's hard to see, especially if you're locked up. Mm. Um, but it, it, is, it is there. It is there. And, of course, we will prevail. You can't keep an artist down. You can't stop stories. Mm. That's, we, all have sto <laughs> we all have stories to tell. And that's art and that's culture. And there is no way that you can ever um, uh, press mute on that. Well said. I, I think what struck me about the work so much was that I think I said, use the word muscularity before, but the sinew of that piece and the... Uh, yeah, everything felt architectural, it was anchored. There was such, um, you know, these, not like statues, but there was, there was roots to every one of these people that, that you'd drawn for us. And I, I always think that's quite an achievement, as you said, to kind of paint, paint everyone with an equal strength or, um, you know, an equal solidity. <laughs> yeah, a solidity and a fluidity. Uh, uh, was the most important thing to me that they didn't necessarily fit into our tropes of gender or sex or or um, our, our roles in life. I mean, and, and to be honest, that solidity and, and fluidity and the roots that you're talking about, they came from the people I was presenting, but they came with that history. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason the Amazons are so feared is that they challenged patriarchal society. Uh, they, 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 they grew in this Greek myth because this very patriarchal society was terrified of this group of women that they'd heard about that don't need to live with men and are still procreating and are still, uh, and they ride horseback and they are warriors and soldiers and they come with these amazing weapons and, and they are buried on horseback, literally buried on horseback. And for all those out there that are going, yeah, but that's a myth. It's not a myth. Those myths came from a place. And they came from uh, the, the Scythian uh, people who were a nomadic female, uh, female heavy tribe that uh, kind of lived around Russia and Kazakhstan. And, and that, you know, they, their 2,000-year-old burial mounds have been found. You can Google this. You can see their amazing warrior outfits. Uh, that, that they were buried in, astride their horses. These fabulous women came, uh, w they gave us their history. They, they, they buried one another right so that we do learn about them now and we remember that we can continue their legend. The Amazon, uh, the Amazons, that, that mythology that's been picked up, all of those women that are in the play, they come, uh, women or, or people who, they might not necessarily be women. They, they might identify as, as another um, gender. But they come with this history uh, that has kind of been belittled by the notion of Heracles. 
uh, they, in Greek, Greek mythology, the Amazons were something Heracles had to deal with when in fact it was the other way around. The Amazons had to deal with fucking Heracles. Mm. Uh, there's a, a list in this play Extraordinary, yeah. of women that are, um, that the, 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 Am uh, the Amazon tribe that I have in this play, uh, they sing for and they mourn for and they grieve for in this kind of um, uh, almost choral chorus that goes on and on and keeps returning through the play. All of those women were indeed killed by Heracles. And yet Heracles right now, his myth has, out, has, has kind of co continues to conquer the names of those women when really he's a gutless killer of women and children, men too, but mostly Heracles killed women and children. And I wanted to change that and honour the women and put Heracles back where he belongs, which is kind of forgotten in history. I, I don't want his name around anymore. Uh, so that's that's where a lot of this came from as well. And I guess that, that that's all kind of going back to your question of, of where do we sit now with our um, gender cruelty, I guess, and where, how where far have we have a man like that in charge of, you know. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Your work has touched previously on, on sort of reproduction and expectations and roles around that. I was sort of shocked, I suppose, by the detail of the horse breeding and the, was that something that you were aware of before the work, <laughs> how that works? I mean, it's, it's so extraordinarily mechanical and, and horrible and, um, yeah. <laughs> yes, that didn't exist at all. And in fact, in, in, in uh, original drafts of the mares, the modern world wasn't there at all. Uh, it was for a, a cast of, of four and I, I wanted to bring, a, a, I guess, a, a parallel, uh, a modern parallel that wasn't an obvious parallel, but I didn't know what that was. And I was doing, I was shooting a film in Wagga Wagga and I was driving, went on a drive one day through that beautiful, beautiful um, area of just farmland and the beautiful river and and gorgeous communities out there and listening to uh the only the only station i could pick up at that time was radio national which is great <laughs> and but there was it was a a real kind of local um debate going on about about horses and and i heard about this and the melbourne cup was just on or was just about it was just on and they were talking about how a teaser stallion had just won the Melbourne Cup, the first teaser stallion to ever win the Melbourne Cup. And someone said, what's a teaser stallion? And then someone described what a teaser stallion was. And I was so horrified, so horrified that this kind of thing existed, that, 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 that a, a horse was used to kind of flirt with a mare and then a big, stronger horse was brought in to mate her, it was sort of like this weird, and look, I'm not an expert. I know that there'll be horse people out there that, that will have a differing opinion to me, but as a lay person, I was like, this is, this is horrific, but I kind of get it. And in a way, the more that they talked about she, her, the mare, I went, I, 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 I can recognize that in our own society and in our own, um, the role that we've, we're often given as women. Uh, uh, at the same time, I discovered that uh, the the Amazons liked to drink, or the Scythian communities liked to drink mare's milk, cumus it's called, but they had a very specific way of getting it out of the mare, which sounds very invasive, but the Amazons did it in a way that was gentle and warm and um, nurturing. And it just, it, it, again, the uh, myth and, and reality smashed up against each other. So I did a little bit of research into horse husbandry and mares and, you know, teaser stallions and, and, and estral cycles of horses. And there was just something there that, that connected, even the word estrus and finding out that that, that means um, in Greek mythology, a kind of madness. 
I, uh, I thought there was something fascinating in, in the connection between now and then and our words and the vernacular we use. I, I think one of the other things I loved about the play was that there's a sense of the world had, had deep rituals in it. And do you find kind of building um, culture within a play that you're making challenging? Are there, are there things that you navigate to build a place that isn't our place? Yeah, I, if anything, I, I am more um, drawn to things that are still our place, that have kind of crossed across eons and eons. Song is a massive one for me. I can't sing to save my life. I, I'm a terrible singer, uh, but I love song. I love voices raised in song. I particularly love voices raised in song that aren't great singers, that is just community uh community harmony uh, and that's why I got the the singing in as much as I could into uh, into the mares just this ongoing chorus of women and female voices and female names there was something very uh, moving about that to me uh, the idea of, of sipping from a cup of something together uh, in this case a cup of milk uh, all of us, you know, were kind of raised on, on our mother's milk to one extent or another or in some, some form of milk. And, and there's something about that that really got me. Um, horses. I felt like horses galloping across time was this constant kind of vision in my head or, or of a mare just coming towards me uh, was another kind of symbol that... So it, it's it, it's those sort of uh, ideas and symbols that that cross time that I'm most interested in, rather than creating anything necessarily new. Uh, and the idea of motherhood is something that uh, that comes up time and again, I guess, in my plays. Uh, um, I can't have children myself, so I'm always questioning my own maternal instinct if it's there was it ever there will it ever be there if it was what could I do about it and but also not just my maternal instinct but the maternal instincts of everyone around me including the men uh, I find that really fascinating and that was another area I wanted to explore in the mares was how the men deal with um, children and their lineage and their place in this world because it's just as complicated as the female side of things, of course. Yeah, I was very moved by that yeah. kind of grief and the, the emotion of burying your, I mean, you know, burying your child and not being able to find them. And you know, those things are so, um, mm. so, so extraordinary in the piece. Um, I suppose just lastly, uh, you know, being fascinated by audiences as, as we all kind of are, was there anything that, that surprised you about the audience's response on the island itself or, or things that were you know, kind of landed differently than what you might have expected? I was in, uh, I was shooting in New York when the play was on. So I was kind of tuning in from afar and watching things from like this, uh, which I've never done before. So I was really worried that because I hadn't been present in the room as much as I wanted to, uh, that that I will I would have lost something or something would have been lost or I, I would and in a way I mean obviously it was in the incredibly powerful and, and warm hands of Letitia Caceres and so I knew it was in it was going to be fine in in terms of the actual show but I I hate not being able to be around an audience and listen to them and see them and talk to them um, fortunately because of social media I was bombarded by by these responses from this little island at the bottom of Australia just these uh, incredible responses uh, a lot of women uh, and men uh, uh, decided to film their responses which I found really incredible that they that, that they'd had such a potent uh, reaction to it that they, they felt compelled to show me uh, that really surprised me uh, but it was such a beautiful way to cross, cross the world and, and get to me. Had many, many letters. I still receive letters about the play uh, from, from all, all walks of life. And most of it was about the struggle 
uh, I guess finally someone has actually not that I really knew I was doing this, but uh, but something in the in the play captured the struggle between genders, not to fight one another, but to get to one another, to reach one another, and and uh, and also who do we place our power with? Uh, so many people were on Antiope's side, and yet so many people were on Thalestra's side, and so many people were on Hippolyta's side. No one was on Her Heracles' side, obviously. <laughs> but it was interesting to see which characters pulled who where. And I think that was the thing that satisfied me the most, is that I don't, this play does not offer any answers to gender imbalance or um, sexuality or necessarily our roles in life it just is just an observation of where the world seemed to be at the time and uh, it's pick your own pathway in a way and thanks respect so one another. thanks so much for sharing and chatting to us and and hopefully we can um, you know contribute to some second lives for the for the work as well um thanks so much oh, for i would love that <laughs> <laughs> Don't be afraid, people. <laughs> I've been mean, well worth it. Um, I am John Kachoin, literary manager at Australian Plays, and we've been chatting to Kate Mulvaney today over Zoom. Her brilliant play, The Mayors, will be out uh, through Australian Plays, Red Door Imprint, uh, before the end of the year. Check it out. Thanks for chatting to us again, Kate. Thanks, John.